Stormy Daniels back in the news. Yeah, real flashback here. As Donald Trump ramps up his latest run for the White House, he's now facing another legal challenge. A grand jury has been convened in the case of hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels by Trump back in 2016. That is according to two sources familiar with the situation confirming the development to NBC News, first reported by the New York Times. The Times reports Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg started presenting evidence to a grand jury yesterday yesterday, centering on a $130,000 payment to Daniels. A spokeswoman for the Manhattan DA and an attorney for the former president both declined comment to us on this matter. Former Trump attorney Michael Cohen, you'll remember, went to federal prison for his role in the hush money payments. He says he met with prosecutors in recent weeks and may be asked to appear before the grand jury. Donald will ultimately be held accountable for this Stormy Daniel payment. This investigation that was to be brought by Alvin Bragg's office, previously Cy Vance Jr., is the most detrimental to him, his freedom, his livelihood, his business, etc., because it's the easiest to prove. The checks are the checks. We know a lot. There's recordings. The first three-month payment was made by Donald Trump, and I gave those to the House Oversight Committee who posted him, and so on. And so he's not in the same position where he can deny or lie the way that he will in some of the other matters. Former President Trump issued a statement on his social media platform yesterday responding to the reports of a grand jury calling it the continuation of a witch hunt against him. Trump hmm. has denied having an affair with Daniels, but he acknowledged he repaid Cohen the coincidental sum of $130,000. Let's bring in lecturer in law at Columbia Law School, Caroline Polisi. She's a federal criminal defense attorney. Caroline, good to see you this morning. So um, it should be pointed out that Michael Cohen, perhaps not the best character at the center of your case. I'll let you correct me if I'm wrong there. He's convicted um, in this matter as well. Um, but what is the legal exposure at this point for Donald Trump? And are you surprised that that Bragg came to this point of a grand jury after seeming to have walked away from it not so long ago. That, that's exactly that right. I think everybody's asking the question, why now? As you noted, we're talking about conduct that occurred in 2016, 2017. Michael Cohen has already pleaded guilty yeah. to, to, to crimes of um, that conduct, served his prison time. Um, Cy Vance, the, the, the former Manhas Manhattan District Attorney before Alvin Bragg, had opened a sprawling investigation, including these hush money payments, um, as well as some other financial crimes. And when Alvin Bragg took over, two of his top prosecutors actually resigned, one of whom, right. Mark Pomerantz, is coming out with a book next week about that. But they resigned because they felt like Bragg did not have the appetite to move forward. He had abandoned his uh, you know, desire to prosecute Trump on an individual basis. Fast forward, Bragg now has two wins under his belt against Trump org, criminal, criminal wins against Trump org and Alan Weisselberg, former CFO of Trump org. Maybe he has some more wind in his sails. Um, you know, this case has been referred to as the zombie theory, mm -hmm. kicking around the Manhattan District Attorney's Office because it just won't die. Um, but apparently uh, it's been resurrected. It's coming back to life. So take us inside one of your entry level law classes and just explain what it means that this has moved to a grand jury phase. How significant is that? Uh, I'd say it's pretty significant. You know, the old saying goes, you can indict a ham sandwich. Um, however, given the political implications of uh, this, in, th this is likely a special grand jury seated. It's seated for longer than a regular grand jury um, in panel to uh, look at more complex financial crimes. I don't think RAG would uh, in panel such a jury and present all this evidence if he weren't going to indict and if he didn't feel like he could get a win. Mika? So, Carol, Caroline, I'm just curious, have you ever seen, and maybe the answer is yes, have you ever seen an individual in history with so many different legal challenges weighing him down, um, whether it be to do with the finances of his own company, rape charges against him, the Georgia investigation, the big lie, uh, the two, the January 6th investigation, special, I mean, this is, this is a pretty long list, so that's number one. I mean, how many legal challenges can one person face without drowning in them? And number two, well, this one seems like so far back in time, it seems smaller in scope. Could this lead to real consequences? 
That's right, Minka. And, you know, the, the question is, which one is going to stick? Heretofore, we thought maybe it was going to be the documents case. Well, that's now sort of been oh, eviscerated. The documents. By, right. <laughs> right. Um, Fonnie Willis, of course, was a dark horse in the race. Um, this one looks like it's, it's sort of coming up. You're right that, you know, uh, Finance crimes of this nature are not sort of uh, the crime of the century. Falsification of documents mm -hmm. in New York is a low-level uh, offense. However, prosecutors can kick it up to a felony offense if they can show that the falsification of the records was done in the pursuit of violating a second New York state law, a second crime, and that law has really been untested. It's akin to what Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to on a federal level in a campaign finance law violation. So the misdocumentation and, um, you know, uh, giving a, a campaign contribution over the legal limit. So were that to happen, and we're obviously projecting a little bit here, but were there to be an indictment uh, and that charge be leveled at for President Trump, what sort of penalty could it be attached if we get a conviction? So if they can do both both charges and it's, and it's kicked up from a misdemeanor to a felony charge, it is punishable by up to four years in prison. It doesn't need prison time, but he could go to jail for up to four years. One of the reporters who first broke this story, senior writer on the Metro staff of the New York Times, William K. Rashbone. William, thanks for being here this morning. We appreciate it. Uh, talk us through a little bit about Alvin Bragg's thinking, according to your reporting, and what else he learned, perhaps, that led him to impanel this grand jury. Well, I can't really, uh, I can't really tell you about his thinking because not inside his head. But, um, you know, the investigation that he inherited from Cy Vance was focused on um, on basically on Donald Trump's business practices on inflating the valuation of his assets. He chose not to go forward with that. They pursued the case against Trump's CFO, Alan Weisselberg, and the companies. Weisselberg pled guilty. The companies were convicted. And now <clears throat> they find themselves, you know, going forward with this, um, with the hush money case. So it's a simpler case than the, um, uh, than the valuations. Um, and it's something that, uh, as was alluded to before, they've come back to and uh, uh, dropped a number of times along the way. So it, it, it's hard to say what the thinking is, but <clears throat> it certainly looks like they are moving closer to, to bringing charges. It's, uh, you know, the next step. One of the flashback names we got in your piece was that of David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer, who was seen actually going into the building in Lower mm -hmm. Manhattan, where the grand jury um, is seated. Um, remind our viewers, if you would, his role in all of this and why he might be an important player. Well, I think um, that Mr. Pecker and a few other people are witnesses because they're part of the arc of the story that precedes the actual payment of um, $130,000 to Stormy Daniels, and then the subsequent reimbursement of that money and some additional funds to Michael Cohen. And uh, Pecker was the publisher of um, the National Enquirer, who had been engaged in uh, what has come to be known, I guess, as catch and kill, meaning purchase or obtain stories and then negative stories about someone, in this instance, obviously Donald Trump, and um, and then actually not publish them, um, hence the kill part. Mm -hmm. um, so that arc uh, in advance of the payment includes Pecker, the editor of the National Enquirer, Hope Hicks, um, <clears throat> some others who, uh, and the chronology is laid out in the search warrant affidavits that um, a judge approved to actually search Michael Cohen's uh, office back in, I guess that was April of 2018, but that chronology of calls and texts um, working towards uh, figuring out who was going to pay and how um, is sort of the that story arc that I refer to. So, John, the story that Michael Cohen pled to was that he funneled the $130,000 from Donald Trump through Michael Cohen, through the campaign, over to David Packer and the National Enquirer to pay off Stormy Daniels, buy her story, and then not publish it so it would go away right around the time of the election in 2016. Right. Trump then reimbursed Michael Cohen for $130,000, but never said as to what, because if he is still denied having this affair in the first place. Uh, William Rashford, great to see you. Um, question, this has been such a source of frustration 
that there, that there has not been a charge connected to Donald Trump. He was individual one all along uh, when Cohen was uh, indicted and convicted to the point, and it was alluded to earlier, two prosecutors even walked off the job because of it. What changed? And more than that, what are these prosecutors who were so frustrated before they left? Like, what's their sense now that it's actually happening? Well, you know, I think, um, I mean, I think you should you should interview them. Um, <laughs> we but, uh, but um, you know, I think that uh, this is a simpler case than the earlier case. Um, you know, I would imagine that those prosecutors, you know, who worked hard to try and put together a case would like to see Donald Trump um, uh, held accountable, um, you know, regardless of, of who's who's sort of running the show. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes. Um, it was an unusual uh, circumstance where you had a transition from one DA to the other in the middle of a extremely complex and um, long running investigation. So there's a whole lot of different factors at play. Um, but, uh, you know, as has often seen, uh, as has often been the case in the past, these um, circumstances uh, so often tend to benefit um, Mr. Trump and uh, or so far. So, Caroline, if you look at this case, Michael Cohen already pled guilty to this story that we're hearing. Yeah. He served more than a year in prison, some more time in, in home confinement. So this was sort of, you know, adjudicated a little bit. So how do you see this playing out? Will you, do you think we're going to see the indictment and perhaps the conviction eventually of someone besides Michael Cohen? Ooh, I learned a long time ago not to not to make, make predictions. Well, where does but, it go from here, but, anyway? Well, I would just note that the, the case is essentially uh, made for them, at least with the documentation, right? In financial crimes, um, you know, money doesn't lie. Following the money here, and as you noted, what is sort of extraordinary about this case is that in the Southern District's prosecution of Michael Cohen, as you're right, as you, as you noted, he sat there in open court and allocuted in his guilty plea that he did made these payments at the behest of individual one who people are colloquial calling, colloquially calling an unindicted co-conspirator. Um, but you sort of have the paper trail there and a theory of the case that's already been, at least in, in a federal prosecution, it's, it's already on paper. And there's a check for $130,000 to Stormy Daniels. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump says, I was just giving Michael Cohen $130,000 for legal fees. Slush just fund. Like, happened yes. to be the same number. Exactly. All right. Caroline Polisi, thank you very much. Always good to see you. New York Times senior writer William K. Rashbaum, thanks for bringing us your reporting you. as well. Appreciate it. Mika. Do you know your constituents any response to all the accusations about the lies that I'm sorry. Um, I have spoken to constituents uh, largely, and um, I've, I've been fielding calls and answers this whole time. Are any of them concerned about any of the accusations that have come out in the media about... You know, the media does one good thing, it is, is you guys like blowing stories that are not there up, and you also use word salads to make sure you confuse the constituency Thank of the you. American people. Irony is dead. George Santos accusing others of word salad. That was Republican Congressman George Santos blaming the media for the string of lies he's told about his education, his resume, his religious background, and his family, some of which he has confessed to. New polling this morning from Newsday and Siena College shows 78% of voters from Congressman Santos's district want him to resign from office, 78%. That includes 89% of Democrats, 72% of independents, and yes, 71% of Republicans want him gone. Joining us now, editor at The New Yorker, Zach Helfand. His latest piece is titled, Meet the Man Who Brought You, George Santos. Zach, it's great to have you on this morning. So, so many people are wondering how this happened. How did this guy get elected? And a big part of the story is a guy named Chris Grant. Who is he? Chris Grant is the operative um, that was uh, the general consultant for the campaign. So he kind of helped run the campaign, guide the campaign in many ways. And in many ways helped George Santos actually win. He runs a consultancy called Big Dog Strategies. So he consults on, uh, last cycle was 100, maybe a little bit more than 100 Republican campaigns. But he was the, the lead operative, kind of the, the Svengali for about eight of them. Uh, and he was the guy who took over uh, George Santos's campaign after the previous consultants quit. 
So we've had all this reporting that even people inside the campaign were aware of George Santos's lies, and some of them even suggested he drop out of the race because it was going to be ugly when they were revealed. That was not the strategy, I take it, of Chris Grant. How did he approach this campaign? Well, so there's still an open question of, of how much they knew. There was this opposition research uh, panel that they co they convened, and, and, and they have this packet of opposition research. We don't know exactly how much they knew, but his his strategy essentially was to run on the issues. And if you look at George Santos, like he, he gave a, a couple speeches on the floor of Congress now. He's not very exciting other than all the fantastical lies. You take that away and there's a lot to take away. But if you take it away, he's a little bit dull. And, and I think in some ways that helped. Uh, he, they, they ran on the issues. They ran on inflation. They ran on crime. And that was basically it. And in a race when maybe a lot of voters weren't paying a ton of attention, it wasn't a presidential year, uh, that was enough. He won by eight points. So it wasn't like he just squeaked by. So this Chris Grant, co-founder of Big Dog Strategies, uh, how does he how did he and Santos get linked up? And Grant, you mentioned, has had you know, a wide resume, a lot of other candidates. Have there been any others that have had any similar embellishments or even in the ballpark of what were Santos? But is this a pattern we're seeing? I wouldn't say it's necessarily a pattern. Um, there are a, a lot of candidates that he represents, and, and they're kind of in, in that world. So you need a political operative. You go to someone like Big Doug. It, it's a name that people know because he's worked on campaigns. He's had a pretty good track record. There was another candidate of his, uh, Steve Watkins, who's kind of like a proto-Santos, mm -hmm. uh, not quite as imaginative maybe, but uh, he, he, uh, he won a race in Kansas for Congress. Uh, he, it later emerged that uh, he had embellished parts of his story. Uh, he said that he was a hero on Mount Everest. He saved people after the earthquake there. Uh, at least he, 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 unlike Santos, he was actually like uh, close to Mount Everest, close to the base camp. Uh, he didn't save anyone. He also, it was unclear if he actually lived in the district. He had some property in Alaska. Uh, it was unclear if he had property in Kansas. He listed his address as a UPS store. Uh, so, uh, it, but this is, I think when you're a political operative, uh, you don't always get to choose your candidates. And uh, the question that interested me is, when do you say no? Do you, know, do, do you cut bait? Um, and the answer for him was, was, no, you stay the course and you try to win. And Gene, obviously one of the lessons so many of these candidates have learned from Donald Trump is when there's scandal out there, when there are lies, just put your head yeah. down and plow through them. Exactly. That's what Trump did. And he, he's still standing, although we don't, we don't know for how long, but he's still standing. Um, Zach, my question is whether uh, the uh, Santos Svengali knew anything or, uh, according to your reporting, about the money that went into the campaign, the, this phantom $700,000 that was lent by Santos and it was not lent by Santos, apparently. Um, where was the money coming from and what was his his window on that or involvement in that? That's a big question. I don't. I, I don't know for sure. Um, so what we do know is that when you're a general consultant for a campaign, one of the things you're overseeing is the budget. Maybe the most important thing that you're overseeing is the budget. On the other campaign, they decided their budget did not include enough money for a really thorough opposition research. Uh, so you can see how important um, uh, managing that money is. So for, um, for Chris Grant, uh, did he know where the money was coming from? That's unclear, but we do know that he was um, one of the people in charge of, of determining the money, allocating the money, planning for what money was coming in. The piece is titled, Meet the Man Who Brought You George Santos. Worth your read at The New Yorker editor, Zach Helfen. Zach, great to see you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. This morning, after the Memphis Police Department announced two additional police officers have been relieved of duty in the wake of the death of Tyree Nichols. The city's fire department also announced three personnel who responded to the scene have been fired. Joining us now, Republican Congressman Anthony D'Esposito of New York. Congressman D'Esposito is a former NYPD detective and a former fire department chief. Congressman, thanks so much for your time this morning. We appreciate it, and you bring your expertise to this conversation. Um, you've called for some changes in the wake of the death of Tyree Nichols. I'm curious, um, the humanity of it hit all of us, the lack of humanity in that video. But as a police officer, uh, as a firefighter, what did you see in that video? Well, I'll start with this. There is uh, nobody that dislikes a bad cop more than good cops. Um, so let, let's focus there. Um, but I think what we saw in this video is that we need to take a hard look at uh, training. 
across this nation and make it uh, standardized so that departments, whether you're in middle America, or the east or west coast, uh, we have the same basic training. Uh, I think that's important to keep our community safe and it's important to keep uh, the members of service safe. So, Congressman, I hear you on that, and I've heard many other people say that, but do you really need training to know not to beat a man within an inch of his life as he's laying on the ground? What training would have changed what we saw there? Well, I think that there's uh, what's happening right now is, unfortunately, many departments are lowering their standards, you know, and it's because uh, of the attack from the far left on law enforcement and the job uh, that people do each and every day. Uh, we've seen it. Uh, I'll use my department of the, the NYPD as an example. I mean, this year alone, we've seen the rec record amount of exits. Um, I think there's nothing more telling when you hear from members of law enforcement who have for generations uh, been part of, of protecting and serving, and they are telling their children, their grandchildren, their nieces and nephews uh, that they shouldn't join the police department because of the attack that we've seen uh, from the far left. So I, I think that we need to embrace, we need to uh, cause call for training, and we need to make sure uh, that uh, departments aren't lowering their standards across this nation um, because uh, it, it's, as we see, it's, it's affecting the day-to-day uh, protection of communities. So, Congressman, you're talking there about lowering the standards of who they hire to become police officers? Correct. I mean, there have been departments uh, throughout this nation um, that have lowered standards because uh, they just don't have people knocking on the door to join the ranks. Uh, you know, there are departments uh, across this nation, and thankfully uh, there are not tons of them, but there are departments where uh, Police officers go to work each and every day to patrol, um, and you know they could be sharing a bulletproof vest with uh, other people that serve. I mean, that, that's no way for us mm. to be uh, having law enforcement act uh, in the United States of America. With all the money that we send uh, across to uh, to foreign nations, we need to focus here and make sure that the police officers and law enforcement have the tools in their tool belt uh, to do the job that they were sworn to do. So, Congressman, I don't think you'll get any argument here that the job of being a police officer in specific districts, specific cities, has never been tougher. You pull up to a call at 11 o'clock at night, uh, no matter the call, there's going to be at least six people there with their cell phones going to record what happens. Uh, the ocean of guns that are around in certain neighborhoods. But at the end of all that, we do live in a nation where there is a lost legion of young men and boys who are living in combat zones, and they're largely African-American, and they have lost all respect, as well as their parents have, for, for policing, how difficult the job of policing is. What do we do about trying to convince young African-Americans and people of color in city after city that the police are there to help not hurt or hinder. Well, I think, I think, first of all, I think that we've seen that uh, in communities throughout this nation where we've seen new leadership that have embraced the community, uh, the, the idea of community policing, about being one uh, with the people that you serve. But I would have to disagree that there's not every community, every African-American or minority community across this nation, are there people there who dislike the police. Uh, I worked in, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which is probably one of the most violent square miles uh, in New York City. And I will tell you that as we've seen, and, and when the, 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 the Democrats in the New York State Legislature passed criminal justice reform, they said that the purpose of that was to protect those minority communities. And those communities are the ones that have suffered most, uh, body bag after body bag being removed from communities like that. And they want police on the street. They want to see men and women in uniform on their corners because there are people, good people that live in those communities who want to go out and get a gallon of milk and not have to be worried about getting struck with a stray bullet. Uh, Congressman, I want to thank you for saying that, because, yes, it is true. No one wants or, um, or needs uh, good policing uh, more than, than people who live in neighborhoods that are afflicted by, by crime. Of course, uh, people want good policing. The, but I, I want to go back to your original point about whom police departments are hiring and why that might have changed. Is it, do you have information that that was indeed a factor? in 
what happened in Memphis, uh, that, that these were somehow uh, unqualified people who became police officers, or, or um, uh, I, because I'm not aware of, of any reporting that suggests that. It rather suggests to me that this unit, this Scorpion unit that they belong to, uh, was given an, the assignment to essentially occupy a community rather than to police it, uh, and to do so in a in a too aggressive uh, and uh, and really unsafe manner. No, I don't have specific information that these individual uh, members of law enforcement were hired under any situation where the standards were lowered. Could they have been? Absolutely. What I'm saying is, is that across this nation, uh, we have seen that people, young people, young people who would have uh, been had a great career in law enforcement no longer, and, that, and that's all communities, that's, that's not just African Americans, that's whites, Hispanics. Uh, People from all walks of life do not want to be a member of law enforcement because they are concerned that they're going to spend their career uh, through the lens, like you mentioned, of a camera phone. And anything that you say or do uh, is unfortunately held against you and, and uh, taken in, in a very wrong direction. This situation was terrible. And like I said when I started, uh, nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. They were held, they are going to be held accountable, and they should have never walked the beat. Uh, they should have never been sworn in, and they should uh, never uh, be able to police ever again. Congressman Anthony D'Esposito of New York, thanks so much for your time this morning, and thank you for your service to the city of New York. We appreciate it. All right. New this morning, the Environmental Protection Agency has announced it will enact Clean Water Act protections for Alaska's Bristol Bay, located north of the Alaska Peninsula. The move will ban the disposal of mine waste in parts of the bay's watershed, which is home to the breeding ground of Alaskan salmon. It will also block a contentious gold and copper mine project known as the Pebble Mine. Joining us now, Democratic Senator Maria Cantwell of Washington. She was the first U.S. senator to oppose the Pebble Mine and has been a leading voice against the project for more than a decade. Thank you very much for being on this morning. Um, explain to our viewers what's at stake. Well, the analysis that the Biden administration is putting out this morning shows that a two-point $5 billion salmon economy and 15,000 jobs could be ruined if a gold mine is built at the headwaters of one of the nations in the world's largest sockeye runs. So they're saying mm. that this is not compatible and it shouldn't move forward. Is there any economic uh, argument for allowing those mines to move forward in some way? Well, I can tell you this, uh, salmon returning to their spawning grounds don't need to flow through toxic waste. And this analysis by EPA shows that there is up to 200 miles of streams and over 1,000 acres of wetlands that will be impacted just by building the mine, just by building the mine. So this is the wrong idea in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so what EPA is doing is the extreme leadership necessary to preserve the resource called salmon. And we applaud them for that. All right, we'll be following this. Also, as chairwoman of the Senate Commerce Committee, you have pledged to get to the bottom of both the Southwest Airlines meltdown from the holiday season. Who can forget that? Especially those who were stuck in airports were stuck not getting where they wanted to go, as well as the failure of the FAA's NOTAM system that uh, you've called for hearings into both of these matters. What do you hope to accomplish and learn? Well, Mika, aviation in the information age has laid bare some real challenges that the airline industry has to address. They need a workforce that can perform yeah. even during the most extreme weather conditions to communicate to consumers about what's happening. And we need the reliability of a system to constantly update and print information and not be subject to just one person not performing their job and leaving the nation without an air transportation system. So we are going to be having a series of hearings on this. Uh, Senator, 
Senator, good to see you this morning. Um, we wanted to talk to you also about the idea of the debt ceiling limit. We know with a lot of decision, uh, a lot of interest will be tomorrow. It was a meeting between President Biden and the House Speaker, their first time since Kevin McCarthy became House Speaker. Uh, so right now, the action, of course, the House, the Senate plays a valuable role as well. What are the conversations you're like having across the aisle in the upper chamber? Are the Senate Republicans you're speaking to going along with these negotiating tactics being flashed by their colleagues in the House? Well, they're not being loud and vocal about it yet, but we don't need the Boehner drama for when we almost went over the fiscal cliff. I mean, we shocked America to its core, wondering what was going to happen in our financial markets if we did default. So the full faith and credit of the United States is here. Let's not play politics. Let's give the certainty the economic numbers we just saw from last quarter are good. Let's continue that. Let's not rile everything up just to play politics in the House. All right, Senator Maria Cantwell of Washington, thank you very much. We really appreciate it.